Good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are, uh, and welcome to this very special event on searching for Syria's missing loved ones. I'm Jonathan Hargreaves, I'm the British Special Representative for Syria. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, and in particular, thank you to the Syria campaign for, for organizing this event. Um, it's wonderful to have such distinguished panelists and guests and wonderful to have so many uh, different participants from such a large and diverse group. I think we've got more than 150 people uh, at this event which uh, is one of the hidden benefits of being able to do these things uh, over the uh, over the internet rather than trying to gather us all in one place. So many, many thanks to all of you for joining and I'm delighted to be uh, joined by co-hosts, uh, my friends uh, Ambassador Robert Roder from Germany and Ambassador Francois Cinema from, from France. Uh, and great that we, the UK, uh, Germany and France are able to co-host this together and well, welcome to them. Um, a lot of this morning will be triggered by watching um, some clips from the excellent documentary Ayuni, which uh, I watched recently, and I found it deeply moving when I watched it. And I'm sure that you will too, if you have not watched it all. If you haven't watched it all, uh, I'm sure you will want to by the end of today. Um, it, it's been filmed over six years and across multiple countries in search of answers. Um, following Noura, uh, who's with us today, and Mashi, as they try and find their loved ones, Basel and Paolo. Among 100,000 people detained by the Syria regime and by Daesh and other groups in, in Syria. And it's a great privilege that we will be hearing from them and from uh, other colleagues who are able to bear witness today. To experience and the experience of them. Amma Mata, a Syrian filmmaker living in Berlin, uh, who was twice detained by the Syrian regime. And in 2013, his brother, Mohammed Noor, was disappeared by Daesh. Uh, and in 2017, he launched the project, Where Are the Kidnapped by Daesh, by ISIS, documenting information about tens of remaining ISIS prisons to find out the fate of kidnapped and uh, to hold perpetrators accountable. Uh, Amma recently testified as a witness in the Koblenz trials. We're also joined by Niveen Al Musa, welcome, uh, an activist with the Families for Freedom, uh, from of whom you will be hear, seeing more in the clips from the film, and the Caesar Families Association movements. Her younger brother Hansa was forcibly detained and disappeared by the Assad regime. In 2014, she sadly recognised his photo among the leaked photos in the Caesar files. She now lives in Germany working for Handicap International as a community manager. And I'm told that one of her favorite sayings is the child. I finally come to Noor as a lawyer since before the uprising in 2011. Noor's husband, Basil, Katabil, who you'll be getting to know in the film that we'll be watching, was arrested by the Assad regime in March 2012, two weeks before their wedding. His execution was confirmed in the photo zone, NGO she launched in Basel's legacy, which advocates yeah, for sorry, the family. There's some serious connection uh, issues. We can hardly hear him with us and uh, talking to us today. Thank you. Before I um, move on, I'd just like to make a couple of housekeeping points. As you know, this, uh, this webinar is being interpreted into English and Arabic. Uh, if you've got any other languages that you want to offer, uh, it would be very helpful if you could speak to in English or Arabic. We have excellent uh, interpreters. Uh, in both of those languages, and there's an option to select your language in the control panel on your screen. I hope you have found that by now. And our brilliant translators, Nicola and Nashua, will be uh, helping us through that. Um, 
after we've heard from our speakers, there will be some time for some questions and answers. Please start thinking of your short questions now. Uh, the shorter the questions are, the more people will have the opportunity to, to ask them. So that would be great. Um, or you can type into the chat bar your questions and we will uh, try to gather those up as a group. Uh, or you're very, very welcome to indicate your interest in answering a question live. Um, and if you want to ask anybody in particular a question, do say so in the chat panel. As, uh, as far as it goes. Um, first of all, I just want to, to say a few things from the UK perspective. Before I move on to uh, allow my co-hosts, Robert and, uh, and Francois, come in. Last week, we all marked the 10th anniversary of the start of the Syrian uprising. Uh, scores of people uh, took to the streets 10 years ago in peaceful demonstrations calling for freedom, dignity and prosperity and an end to corruption. And as you all know, a key flashpoint in that uprising was the brutal detention, torture and murder of 13-year-old Hamza by the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Hamza wasn't the first and he wasn't the last to disappear from the streets or to be tortured and murdered whilst in detention. Since then, tens of thousands of Syrians have faced the same fate at the hands of the regime and of Daesh and other non-state armed groups. For most people, their families now have to find a way to survive and carry on with their lives without knowing about the fate of their loved ones. And even if they do know, there's very little that people can often do to help. The recent UN Commission Inquiry report, which came out, that the well-documented of detention in and that they've been a cause and a trigger and a persistent feature of the conflict over the last 10 years. It says arbitrary detention has been used as a deliberate to instill fear and to financial gain. As we'll hear testified to this morning, the, that report testifies to the unimaginable suffering endured by detainees and those who live to tell the tale, who've described foreign detention conditions, sexual violence, torture and executions. I can't imagine what it's like for so many Syrians, including some of those with us today, desperate for information, it means that this really is a, a national trauma that we, Syria's friends, urgently want to address. That's why we need the UK are proud to support partners like the International Commission on Missing Persons to work with courageous Syrian civil society groups and, to, and build a central record of all those who are missing. Last month in Koblenz, Ayad al Kharib was sentenced by the court to four and a half years in prison for aiding and abetting crimes against humanity. He may have been a small cog in the well-oiled Assad regime killing machine, but the public testimony and evidence of the crimes perpetrated against Syrians does send an important message to perpetrators of those crimes in Syria. And there's a vast and growing body of damning evidence collected by many courageous organizations and individuals, often with the support of international donors such as ourselves, which I hope will one day be used in court against the regime's chief villains. Accountability is slowly catching up with them. The evidence is piling up and thanks to universal jurisdiction in Germany and elsewhere in Europe, and thanks to the relentless work of Syrian human rights defenders diligently documenting crimes, the perpetrators of atrocities may not enjoy human impunity forever. It's a real privilege to have the opportunity to listen to our speakers today and to hear their lived experience as loved ones and seekers of those who have disappeared, and as representatives in the international community and friends of Syria. We all, all see views and ideas on what more what we need to do and how we can cooperate better. Our job is to make sure that this is not an age of impunity. 
With that, I'd like to hand over to Ambassador Robert Roder from Germany for a few opening words as one of our co-hosts. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you very much, Jonathan, and uh, good morning to, to everybody. Dear Nivin Al Musa, uh, dear Nur Arazi, dear um, uh, Amar Mata, Rebecca, Jonathan, Francois, ladies and gentlemen, let me just add my voice in thanking the UK and France, and especially also the Sura campaign for organizing together this very timely side event. Uh, and I will be very brief because, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, today we are here to give a voice to our Syrian friends and their personal stories. Jonathan has said already, a decade has passed since a group of children sprayed anti-regime slogans on a wall in Dara. The answer from Damascus was brutal repression, arrests, and torture. Since then, a decade of death, destruction, and endless pain has crushed people's hope for a change. We have had to make use of every negative superlative to talk about the scale of loss and suffering in Syria. And the conflict is far from being over. Hundreds of thousands have lost their lives. Half of the population has fled the country or been forcefully displaced. And more than 150,000 have disappeared. Fathers, mothers, sisters, brothers and friends have to ask themselves unbearable questions every day. Where's my husband? Is my daughter still alive? In Syria, detainees live under cruel conditions. They are deprived of the most basic needs, but above all, from their human dignity. More than 14,000 Syrians have died under torture. The people of Syria have paid the highest price. We, not, we may not be able to feel their pain, but it is our duty to alleviate their suffering. Families of detainees and missing persons deserve to know what happened to their loved ones in the prisons of Syria, and they deserve justice. The call is on all of us to join the fight against impunity. Germany and its partners are determined to hold perpetrators of these crimes accountable and to achieve justice for the victims. The German judiciary is leading edge when it comes to prosecuting those crimes. The recent jail sentence handed down by the court in Koblenz was a historic landmark, and it sends a clear message. Whoever commits crime against humanity or war crimes cannot feel safe anywhere and will eventually be held accountable. Germany strongly supports the international impartial and independent mechanism and the Commission of Inquiry on Syria as they are key for ensuring accountability for crimes committed in Syria. Furthermore, we support a number of projects collecting, documenting, securing, and safeguarding evidence of the crimes committed. The initial successes are due in no small part to the work of Syrian NGOs and human rights activists. Just to mention the recently published Truth and Justice Charter, or the Syrian law, however, by no photo zone of today's panelist, Noura Razi. Jonathan already mentioned the Commission for International Justice and Accountability or the important work of the International Commission on Missing Persons. They closely work together with the civil society in Syria and families of the missing in order to collect data and to build up a central record. A last word on our support for the international um, political process in accordance with UN Security Council Resolution 2254. It is more than the Constitutional Committee. It's also a clear call for unconditional and large-scale release of detainees and more meaningful action on missing persons. The conflict in Syria must not last for another 10 years. We must not accept the status quo. Let us work together to ensure that none of these crimes goes unpunished that perpetrators are held accountable, that victims will be heard. That's why it is so important to hear our panelists and their stories today. We must not remain silent in the face of these atrocities because justice matters. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And I'd like to hand over to our third co-host, Ambassador Sinemo from France. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, dear Mrs. Uh, Hazi, uh, Mrs. Almusa, Mr. Matar, uh, my friends and colleagues, uh, Jonathan and 
and Robert and and uh, and Rebecca from the Syrian campaign who has been doing a great job on this on organizing this event, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would like first to to thank my uh, colleagues from uh, the UK and and Germany, as well as the Syrian campaign for putting this event together, and bringing us all around the table to help bring this uh, this issue at the top of our priority where it belongs. By the way, uh, you may have noticed in the many uh, statements that were issued last week on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of uh, the conflict and the revolution, that of course, uh, accountability is one of our top uh, priorities, especially for um, the EU member states and EU um, itself. Uh, I'm very happy to meet virtually uh, with uh, Ms. Uh, Nora Hazi, as we have supported the No Photo Zone for some time now, and the commitment of NGOs and the Syrians abroad to make sure that the voices of the detainees, the missing, and their uh, families are being heard is essential. Facts and numbers uh, that were mentioned by uh, previous speakers, I believe they need not be repeated, hurt our sense of humanity. Their scale is unmatched in recent history and has been a characteristic of the Assad regime in the country. Even more, even before the conflict uh, began, Syrians who had lived through prison testified of the most horrible crimes witnessed or injured when in detention. I think in particular of uh, Syrian writer Mustafa Khalifa, who is now living in France, who described in his memoirs the barbaric experience of his years in the infamous Permara uh, prison. In the past 10 years, enforced disappearance has been a hallmark of the Syrian conflict as terrorist groups went on to do the same. The Caesar report has shown the world evidence of the most serious, cri serious crimes under um, international law being committed in Syrian prisons. The regime, which bears, of course, the greatest responsibility, has shown no pity and has refused any releases, even of women and children. The film, A Uni, of which a short clip will be showed today, powerfully uh, describes the plight of families searching for their missing loved ones, finding no answers. After 10 years, impunity for the perpetrators of crimes committed in Syria has to stop. We reiterate our unwavering support to international investigative and evidence collection bodies. Of course, the international impartial and independent mechanism and the International um, Commission of Inquiry. Their invaluable work gives hope to the Syrians that they will see justice one day. Meanwhile, National courts are offering new avenues for accountability. We welcome the Conblent's uh, trial, and um, we also are uh, very uh, happy and proud of the cooperation between uh, the German and the French judiciary in order to bring uh, perpetrators to, uh, to justice. The French judicial authorities are currently conducting about 40 proceedings related to crimes committed in the Iraqi Syrian zone and have issued, um, issued arrest warrants. We also strongly support the work of NGOs towards legal empowerment of the victims and their families. Such steps towards accountability are paramount as we uh, believe that justice is a condition for a lasting peace. And I think this is, of course, uh, a very important um, uh, matter. There can be no justice without peace. There can be no peace without justice. Peace in Syria can only be achieved through a comprehensive and genuine political solution. We echo the call by um, UN Secretary General uh, Special Envoy, Mr. Geir Pedersen, for mass humanitarian releases. Sadly, it has so far been left unanswered by the regime and its backers. We recall that uh, UNSCR 2254, the only internationally uh, agreed roadmap out of the crisis, calls for confidence-building measures 
and reiterate, therefore, our demand of the release of all arbitrary detained persons in the hands of the regime and information about the fate of the missing. Those are part of a, uh, a part and parcel of any genuine settlement to the crisis and one of the preconditions for refugees to regard Syria as a safe country to return to. Yet the regime has shown no willingness even to discuss um, this track. So we support all initiatives that will make it possible to achieve progress on the issue of detainees in the hands of the regime and missing persons. Ten grim, terrible years have passed. We should not allow for impunity to last any longer. And I am, of course, very eager to hear now our panelists uh, and to hear of their personal and collective uh, experience. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francois. And thank you, Robert. So let's move on now to uh, hearing, uh, as we have said, from the voices of Syrian colleagues. And we're going to start with a first short clip from the film that we've mentioned, Ayuni. Um, so I think. Rebecca, you are going to show us. Thank you. And I understand you got married while he was still in prison, is that right? Yes, yep. we got married, uh, we made the marriage contract on uh, January 7, mm -hmm. 2013. Yep. And they call us uh, the bride and the groom of the Syrian revolution. There are at least five people of our network who are killed. What do you think about your own safety? Um, I'm, I'm pretty safe. Right? You upload all this material, you get it out to the world. Personalmente, ma non solo io, non abbiamo nessuno che il rischio della speranza. I didn't see the body, I didn't see document, I didn't see anything, any evidence. Do you think you ever will? I have to. I will keep going on to have his body and all the information about his death, uh, the way, the date, all the thing. I have to, be, all the people, all the Syrians have to, this is a humanitarian right. So I have to face this disaster. Thank you so much. And with that, I'd like to hand over and introduce Naveen Almusa. Welcome, Naveen. Thank you for being with us uh, from the Families for Freedom campaign and the Caesar Families Association campaign. And um, we look forward to hearing your words. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. As you just saw in the film trailer, <clears throat> the search for truth about Syrian detainees to free them and seek justice for them for these cries has become a defining aspect of lives of thousands of Syrians like me. My name is Nivin Al Musa. I am one of over 130,000 families who are waiting or have waited to hear about our loved ones who are detained and disappeared. We all know that history is written by the winners the way they like. In 2012, sorry, 2011, 
Syrians demanded freedom and dignity. We raised our voices against being ruled by the one family, one man, and one party. And now, 10 years later, we have been faced with violence, starvation, chemical weapons attacks, detention, and forced disappearance. Families in Syria fear documenting the names of their loved ones. Yet, even with the fear, families and human rights groups have documented 130,000 detainees, and over 15,000 people have been tortured to death, 99% of them in the regime's uh, prisons. Assad and his regime seek to destroy people's lives even after being set free. So rape is one of the methods of torture used in his detention centers. In Syria, women are not only arrested because they are politically active, but rather to be used as a pressure card on men in a society characterized by conservatism. What if Assad is allowed to win? In spite of his dictatorship and all these crimes, will we ever hear terms like democracy, freedom, coexistence, coexistence, and justice in Syria? What will our country look like? Moreover, what will the whole region and Europe look like? As part of the Families for Freedom, move for the fam for the for sorry, as part of the Families for Freedom movement and with the Caesar Families Association, I am fighting alongside other families whose loved ones were disappeared by Assad, ISIS, and other actors in Syria. For a different ending to, to this history, that is our right. My brother Hamza was killed under torture in Assad detention centers. I cannot imagine how cruel a person has to be to torture another person to death. Nobody can bear the pain we, uh, we as a family has been taught, sorry. Nobody can bear the pain of a family that has been told, forget about him, he's gone. That's simply what they said to my aunt when she traveled from Hama to Damascus to ask where her nephew was. He had been detained since August 2012 until we recognized his photo in the leaked teaser photos in 2015. More than 28,000 photos that were, that were smuggled out of Syria of deaths in Legion detention centers. My brother Hamza would have turned 33 this year he was a good-humored, lively, handsome young man who only dreamed of a Syria that assures our rights as humans, the rights stipulated in international conventions that should be taken for granted and that we shouldn't have to dare to dream of in Assad's Syria. He was disappeared as he came home from his university in Aleppo to Hama, where we used to live. Forced disappearance continues to this day. It's one of Assad region's crimes, but not the only. I myself was wanted by the regime for demonstrating and publishing the demonstration of my hometown on social media and in the press. And my husband, Mohammed was coming back from his university in 2012 when a sniper shot him in the head. He survived only to find out later that the snipers on that checkpoint were gambling for a cigarette or a cup of tea whether they could shoot a moving target. I am not here today to recite all of the Assad regime's crimes against humanity. I am here to insist on our right to know where our missing loved ones are, where they were buried if they were killed, and to insist that the Assad regime and all groups that are involved in crimes against humanity in Syria must be stopped and must be held accountable. 
we demand urgent action, lives can be saved. Firstly, all detention must stop. All detained men, women, children, and elderly should be set free. At the very least, humanitarian actors could and should have access to the detention centers to provide aid and report honestly on the humanitarian situation. With the spread of corona, our nightmares are worse. Thinking of the crowded health and hygiene conditions in the detention facilities. Next, we demand accountability and justice at the highest level. There should be a dedicated UN Security Council resolution on detention and forced disappearance. And the UK, France, and Germany must work harder to persecute war criminals. We need a comprehensive approach to justice. I hope one day to see Assad himself in the front of an international tribunal or the international criminal. Naveen, you're on mute. If you could unmute. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I will repeat. We need a comprehensive approach to justice. I hope one day to see Assad himself in front of an international tribunal or the international criminal court. Last month, five victims and family associations presented the Trust and Justice Charter. For over a year, we worked together to present a unified vision for justice, for the crimes of arbitrary detention and enforced disappearance in Syria. We underline the urgent need to stop violations and alleviate the plight of survivors and their families. We also stress the importance of developing effective ways to prevent such offenses recurring in the long term. Finally, I call on you to join me and call for freedom for all detainees around the world. Thank you. Nivin, thank you so much um, for those extremely powerful words. Uh, thank you. Just before I introduce the next clip, uh, just a, a a technical point, just in case anybody didn't catch it or if I didn't say it properly at the beginning. If you go to the language interpretation function, uh, you should select the language that you want to be in. Uh, and there is translation in both directions. Uh, so if you haven't done that, then please do. That will make uh, your life easier. Thank you again, Nivin. And um, so next we're going to have a, another clip from Ayuni. Um, and this one, I think, focusing very much on Noura, who will be speaking straight afterwards. مثل ما عرفنا انه انتم بدكم تنفضوا هلا بهي الايام الاستثنائيه يعني فينا نقول عنها عظيمه شو شعوركم او ليش قررتوا انه تعملوا هي الخطوه؟ كثير منيح لانه كثير بنحب بعض وكثير مناسبين لبعض وكثير بدنا نعيش مع بعض نحن تعرفنا على بعض دوم حصار كنا مقاصرين سوا بنفس البيت تعرفنا مع بعض اول ما شفنا بعض ما طقنا بعض 
انا ما طقته بس لا انا كمان ما طقته كويس انا كثير ما طقته كثير اخذت عنه فكره غلط بس طلع بالعكس انت الايمان انه رح نقدر نحقق اللي بدنا دوله مدنيه بتغيير هذا الواقع يعني نحن اوريدي قطعنا الشوط الاكبر ما بقى غير فترة كثير قصيرة ما في حتى نوصل لهون خليني اسالكم عن شعور الخوف في هي الايام شو بيعني لكم؟ في خوف وشو طبيعته؟ انا انا كثير بخاف كثير كثير هلا كنت عم بحكي لنا لهالحدث كثير عندي وساوس مخيفه لا. قبل ما نكون نحن بعلاقه مع بعض ما كان ما كان عندي اي شعور بالخوف بس هلا هيك صار في خوف على علاقتنا اكثر من خوف على حالنا كافراد يعني باسل الصفدي وهي هويتي على فكرة الموبايل أكثر شيء بيثبت شخصيتي حاليا أعلن أني بحب نورا غازي بسبب صفاتها من أخلاق وحنان ومنعومة وأني بعد هذا اليوم لن أصبح لن أخونها بعد اليوم بعد هذه اللحظة لا لا اليوم بعد بكرة وبسبب ممارسات الأمن القمعية ونظام الأسد الفاشي تعرفت على نورا غازي بس أنا يعني قبل ما أصير عروس شعري مزيت فزلت بالسوق كتير فأجري مو لاني وسخه لاني ماشي كثير بالبلد وسخه والله ما في حدا وسخ هو دقنه طويله And now it's my great privilege to uh, invite Noura Ghazi, whom you've just seen in that clip, uh, who's a, a lawyer and long-standing activist for Syria's detainees, to say some words. Noura, thank you very much. Thank you. Three years ago was the Mother's Day in Syria. I always feel that this day is the hardest day for all those mothers who are waiting their beloved disappeared sons and daughters to return, or even to a miracle that reveals their fate. For all those kids who are waiting their moms to come back and hug them again. Why am I, I, uh, am I starting with mentioning this day despite of that I don't have kids? The question itself has the answer. I haven't had the privilege to be a mom, and this matter is killing me every day, especially in the Mother's Day, and particularly this year. Not only because I miss my mom, who is in Syria in a very bad health situation, but because I am 39 now, and my chance to have kids is becoming so little. This is a very small injury that caused by the Syria regime and by the indecisive attitude of the international community. When I made my decision to marry Basil in prison, I thought about that 
this marriage would mostly prevent me from having kids and I didn't mind to sacrifice anything for my unlimited love to Basel. My only desire was just to keep visiting my Basel in Adra prison on those Saturdays, Mondays and Wednesdays. But sadly, they took Basel again from me in 2015 as they took him from me in 2012, two weeks before our wedding party. As we are now in the 10th anniversary of the great Syrian revolution, I do want to describe how 2011 also carried my own revolution. My life love Basel was my own revolution. As with him, I have discovered whom I am, what I want. I felt this different taste of freedom each time I looked to his eyes. I was a girl who forcibly deprived from her dad because of enforced disappearance and detention many times. This girl who was who decided to be a human rights lawyer when she was only 13. Basil was executed and I am still keeping my promise to him and to the world and even to the Syrian regime to immortal, immortalize his memory as long as I am alive. I didn't only lead Free Basel campaign with Basel's amazing friends, which became one of the most important campaigns in the world. Not only invested my suffering to spot the light on the issues of torture, military field court, Sednaya jail and summary execution. I'm still struggling to get, to get Basel's remains in a try to find a closure to this open wound in my heart that bleeding every single moment. I lived the suffering of missing my dad before, but to live this with, with a husband is totally different. It is so problematic. Uh, there are tens of thoughts and feelings that surround me, like getting married again, having kids with the running time, and I don't have answers to myself, to my family, and to everyone. I'm just stuck with the uncertain and delusions. I just want a grave to cry on, to put his favorite flowers, to talk to him and close this killing, confused situation. Ayuni was one of the most important movies that made with me, with the great director and friend Yasmin Fidda. I remember each moment with Yasmin during the shooting in many countries. Yuni is not only a film, it is a reflection about what happened in Syria and with Syrians. Yuni is showing how I loved Basel, how I fought for him and for other detainees. My endless love to Basel has urged me to establish no photo zone the NGO that named by him in 2011. It was a joint idea between him and me. This NGO, which made me apologize of going to UK for a scholarship with the Chevening to get a master's in international human rights and humanitarian law in Sussex University in Brighton, the city appears in the first show of Abuni. No photo zone is the second important thing I did in my life after marrying Basel in prison. I work with my censor team in Lebanon, Syria, and soon in Turkey, every day with women like me. Women suffer every day from the terrible absence of their beloved forcibly disappeared men. We provide legal assistance and empowerment to those women in terms of gaining their rights and the rights of their beloved missing ones. We are also raising awareness and advocating for all the legal and the human rights issues related to arbitrary detention and enforced disappearance, especially from the perspective of the suffering of refugees women. We spot the light on their stories to enable them to get the leading role on the issues of forcible disappearance. We have now almost 700 Syrian families in Lebanon that we provide daily based legal and social services to them. No photo zone is the reason that pushed me to face a new day without Basel, my family and Syria. As we create this solidarity network with amazing women that we support each other every day, even emotionally. Those women pass their message to you through me. They want the truth about the fate and the whereabouts of their beloved ones. They want to be seen and heard. They want a serious and moral resolution for the Syrian conflict and they want to be represented in every international forum. And on behalf of them, I would like to express my respect to the great action made by many European countries and Canada in terms of justice and accountability, 
specifically Germany, and to urge all of your good selves to push for ending the conflict in Syria. As we all know, whom the criminals and how the crime should be ended. And we all know that to eliminate the crimes and to put an end to the criminals are better a million times than watching the crimes and account the, criminal, the criminals afterward. I beg your pardon to be extremely honest to say that I am very frustrated as I couldn't see a real action towards Syrians, specifically detainees by the international community, despite all those thousands of evidences and testimonies. It is 10 years now, for God's sake, 10 years of killing, bombing, torture, sexual abuses and enforced disappearance. 10 years on a whole generation of kids and youth without education, medicine, shelters, and future. And I do keen on to hear your strategy to end the conflict and to rebuild Syrians before Syria itself. Excuse me to be emotional and allow me as conclusion to thank you for taking the time to listen to me and my appreciation to the distinguished representatives of Germany, UK and the French foreign affairs and to my great colleagues in the Syria campaign for holding this event. May we all celebrate the freedom, truth and justice. Nora, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for speaking so personally and with such incredibly powerful personal testimony. Uh, we really, really value that. And thank you for speaking on behalf of other women in Syria as well. And we hear, your, uh, hear you channeling other women's voices and uh, we, we listen to that. Thank you. Just before I introduce the next clip, just to remind you, uh, we're going to have one more clip and, and one more intervention from Amma, uh, and then we'll go into question and answer. So do please um, start preparing your, uh, your questions or your comments. Uh, as I said, the, the shorter your questions or comments are, the more of them we can have. Uh, so brevity will be much appreciated, uh, but we look, look forward to a, a really good discussion. So now we're going to go on to our third clip. Hi, Did you was surprised when uh, you you know that uh, Paolo was kidnapped? فاجأت إنه إنه ليه تفاجأت وقت وقت كان بالرقة إنه ليش راح الرقة لأنه يعني صرنا نحس وقتها بخطر هائل إنه ليش نحنا يعني مع داعش خطف بيها باولو بي بالرقة كانت هي يعني لحظة هزة بالمجتمع لأنه كان هو ضيف وما كان يعني كان الناس يعني إجوا صحفيين خطفوا بس بالنسبة للأب باولو كان في شيء إحساس فعلا إنه هو إنه هو ضيف المدينة فالناس حسوا بتأنيب ضمير هائل ما قدروا يدافعوا او ما قدروا يستعيدوا انا رحت على السجن اللي يفترض يكون مسجون في باولو ومحمد نور اللي هو سجن السد ما في ولا اسم على الحيطان ولا ورقه بالمكان فما بعرف انا واثق اذا اذا بيصير في جهد حقيقي انا واثق 100% راح نلاقي شيء عن المختطفين أو أقلها راح نلاقي جثثهم بالمقابر الجماعية. في الوقت هو دايما ببالي وقت نحن عم ندور عن وقت عم ندور عن أخي محمد نور. How old is your brother? أربعة وعشرين. 
this is the present. This is the present. Yes, this is yeah. the present. Thank you. And now over to you. Uh, pleasure to introduce Amar Mata, whom you just saw in that uh, in that clip. He's going to talk about the search for people who were kidnapped by Daesh uh, during this uh, awful and complex uh, conflict over the last ten years. Amar. Thank you very much. Thank you that I've been given this opportunity to speak to you. Thank you to all the colleagues. I'm going to speak now about my brother, Mohammed Noor, who is seven years younger than me. Mohammed Noor was a photographer who started his career in photographing the demonstrations that went out against Assad in 2011 in Syria. And he kept on taking pictures until ISIS uh, entered his city Raqqa in, in the east of Syria. He was abducted in um, a summer night in 2013, and so far we know nothing about him until this way there. Um, that was one of the situations which very much impacted on our lives, this kind of abduction we were exposed to, we, we were a big amount of frustration and we almost lost hope that we'd ever get out. And over these years, we've suffered a great deal, obviously. And now we are still going ups and downs with the hopes raising and we're still asking ourselves, are we going to finish, find him? And on other days we think, no, there's no hope left at all. Seven years after he's been abducted, there's a real sense that in fact, dozens or thousands of people who were abducted by ISIS are really people who have been forgotten by the local forces either the International Alliance who was fighting against ISIS or the militias who are present on the ground, such as the Free Syrian Army and so on of us, which took over wide areas, or even in, in Iraq, which were taken over by them from ISIS. Now, we had the, used to have the dream that we are going to find Mohammed Noor in one of the prisons which were being captured, which were being freed and that he would be freed and released with other prisoners, detainees, uh, photographers, and also friends and family members. But unfortunately, up to this very day, we have not been able to obtain any information from any side. And at the same time, nobody, we gave us the impression that they are really interested in in this issue. That brought me and a number of friends and colleagues to the point because that we really wanted to undertake something serious in searching for him. We started to look inside prisons in Syria and Iraq. I started to go there myself and to search for my brother. And I went through dozens of thousands of documents from inside these prisons and to, to look into the stories of dozens of thousands of people who used to be held in these prisons. But and I've, that gave me the feeling of increased responsibility that it's not only about my brother, quite frankly speaking, but that is it, it is about thousands of families 
who are suffering this bitterness each and every day, the same bitterness my family and me are living through every day. And this really made me work hard on preserving these documents and to think about how we can really help and hand over these informations in a respectful way to all the families. Nowadays, we have done this because most of the prisons which were held by ISIS were either being transformed again into prisons in Syria or Oh, no document or no information from any of the parties involved in the international coalition or who were involved in the fight against ISIS. They, went, they never shared any of this information with the concerned families. The, that was a real frustration and deception for people inside and outside too. That we are not really on the top list of priorities of these uh, countries and parties cities were destroyed and for us it, we thought that would be for our best and then we would get any information or anything but unfortunately no such information has been passed on to the families the prisons were destroyed which had been conquered by ice the work on the mass graves in Syria, in Iraq, and on the forced disappearance is very limited, and it's only very limited scope of work undertaking on this account in, in Syria, in Iraq, in both presence under the regimes there. We have not seen any justice being to done. We were not part of any part of the judicial proceedings under being undertaken. Uh, with so no mass releases are taking place from and they, they were people of course released from ISIS but we have no evidence that these people which have were being released or which had been executed that they were part of those held by ISIS or they were involved with ISIS and that they uh, undertook the killing and abduction of our loved ones so international representatives of states they may really be trying to well try to strive for no how shall i put it to, to strive for to think properly about the course of justice which is currently taking place because I used to have the hope, me and thousands of families, that when ISIS would be removed, that we would be able to get to information about our loved ones. But now we have almost lost this hope entirely. And we would hope that this might change and that there would be a serious thinking about changing, changing this track and to find out something about the fate of these thousands of people who were uh, held in Iraq and Syria by ISIS and that we get some information about what happened to them. Emma, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all of you. I, I'm sure everybody uh, in this at this event will join me in in thanking all three of you very deeply for such personal uh, and almost un unbelievably powerful testimonies um, and for your rallying cry uh, to all of us to um, uh, do everything we can to bring justice and to bring this conflict to an end. So now we're going to move into uh, a discussion. Um, I, I'm hoping that we will hear as much as possible from our speakers. Um, so please do um, direct questions to, to anybody you like, uh, but in particular to our speakers. Um, You'll, you're very welcome to do that by raising your hand or by putting a 
uh, question in the chat bar, as some people already have done, for which thank you. Uh, and um, colleagues are going to help me to field those questions and to, and to direct them. So, Hi, I'll help um, pick the questions for you. So Great, um, thank you, Rebecca. Will the UK and France push for a dedicated UNSC resolution on detention? That's one question. Do you want to take a few at a time? So, so uh, I, from the questions I saw so far, uh, I, I saw a batch of questions uh, that I take were um, directed a little bit at uh, the three hosts of this. Uh, one about a, a UN resolution specifically, but others about uh, other things that we are doing or can do in terms of the overall political process. So maybe uh, I can take those as a as a group. Um, and uh, I'm going to hand over, I think, if I may, to, uh, to, to Robert and Francois to uh, address that batch of questions about what the international community, particularly those represented here today, is doing and can do more to um, move on the political process uh, and also to take that question about a specific resolution on, uh, on detainees in the missing, if I may. Uh, Robert, can I start with you? Yes, sure. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Um, and, and thank you very much. Uh, I would like, uh, first of all, to thank uh, especially the three panelists because I saw the clips of the film several times beforehand, but related now to the testimonies of the speakers, it's something different and it was very moving and I can share your, your frustration. I, I cannot share your pain because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, personally not, not touched, but I mean, it was, it was really uh, very emotional and, and I, I can understand and you. I mean, there were several questions on why um, Assad is not uh, before uh, the International Criminal Court or an international tribunal. I think that's basically because, I mean, um, uh, you need a Security Council resolution to, for, for a referral to the International uh, Criminal Court. And uh, we all know that, I mean, uh, this is uh, not possible. It was tried several times, but there was vetoes from uh, certain partners, I mean, who uh, uh, were against the deferral to the, to the International Criminal Court. There is uh, another court in, 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 in uh, uh, another criminal court, but it needs to be uh, signed uh, the the Rome Statute by the uh, by the Syrian regime, which is not the case. So um, uh, unless um, um, the Security Council is not uh, unblocked, it's uh, difficult uh, to defer this case um, uh, to 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 an international court. That is why I mean the um, uh, national legislation jumps in because we have, I mean, this principle in, in our German law, and that is why, I mean, um, uh, these cases in, in the court of, of, of uh, Koblenz took place. So I think it's the second best option, but it's uh, for the moment the only option we have. And uh, I think uh, it's good to send out this signal that even if the Security Council is blocked, I mean, these crimes are not going unpunished. Uh, but certainly, I mean, we are not any more member in the Security Council, but I mean, we have been to the Security Council for the last two years. And I mean, the question of detainees uh, and missing persons has been high on our agenda. So, I mean, we were aiming for a presidential statement because a resolution, I think, I mean, it, um, um, it's the same question, I mean, with some partners in the Security Council, but Francois and, and Jonathan, I mean, they are in, they, they know it better th than myself. What we are doing is, I mean, uh, to push for a political process. We all know that a military solution is not possible. Um, I know it's, it's frustrating and it's also frustrating for us. Uh, but I mean, um, uh, the only way, I mean, we can put pressure on Russia and, and the regime is to keep up uh, our principled approach. So without uh, accountability, without uh, justice, without a political solution, there will be no normalization, there will be no uh, reconstruction, there will be uh, uh, no um, 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 normalization and um, um, no lifting of sanctions. So I think it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's a leverage that we have, but certainly, I mean, uh, um, it takes a while and, and I can share your frustration. I mean, it's uh, all with us as well. 
but we, I mean, we, we constantly remain engaged um, uh, in, in this process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Francois, would you like to come in? Yes, well, thank you. Just a few words because I think Robert's uh, presentation was um, was very um, um, very consistent, and um, he, he, I think he mentioned all the the, the main uh, the main issues. I'd like to remember that in Resolution two two five four, there is a call for uh, confidence building measures uh, that can uh, concern uh, uh, the uh, the issue of. Uh, of of uh, missing uh, uh, persons and so this is something very important we all support uh, mr gay pedersen's uh, call for uh, the release massive release or release on a large scale i think this was the expression um this call was issued last year in march if i if i my recollection is um is, is correct and i think this is a very good thing uh, that uh, should be uh, put forward. Uh, we also think, uh, and Robert mentioned it before in his uh, opening remarks, that um, of course the um, Constitutional Committee is not the one and only issue that should be dealt with uh, within uh, the um, uh, environment uh, the, of the uh, of the UN, and so many other subjects should be. Um, opened and put on the table. And of course, accountability is, is one. So we are uh, pushing this issue regularly to the Security Council, as Robert mentioned. Uh, we are supporting, uh, of course, very strongly uh, the Triple IM uh, and the uh, Commission of, um, of Inquiry. And at our at national levels, uh, especially with uh, Germany, uh, of course, our judiciary systems are quite active in uh, prosecuting uh, criminals that we can uh, identify. So uh, there's a whole set of uh, measures we can um, we can take, uh, and of course, one reason why uh, uh, Jonathan, Robert, and and myself are present today is, is really to 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 tell you that we are certainly not about to um, give up on this accountability issue, which is on top of our agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and not to repeat all of that, but just to endorse it from the UK perspective. Um, agree very much with what my German and, and French friends have said. The, the, uh, this is a, a unbelievably painful and frustrating situation that we all uh, fervently uh, want to move on from and to find a peaceful political solution to. Uh, we do everything in our power to, to bring that about. What we, of course, need most is for the regime and its backers to want that to happen. And um, in order for us to be able to move on with a genuine political process, we need to see some real, uh, real moves from them. And uh, as others have said, this, this file on detainees and missing persons is one of those where they could uh, demonstrate that they are willing to move things along and they could take concrete steps and they could uh, build your confidence and our confidence that they seriously want to uh, have a political process which can lead to a, lead to a peaceful solution. And uh, that is what we uh, want to see. Uh, so we will remain absolutely engaged in that. Um, as, as my colleagues have said, um, I think we have some questions uh, from the floor. Uh, I, we have three people who would like to come in uh, orally. I, and uh, Rebecca can help me by bringing them in. I think, first of all, uh, Rory, you wanted to ask a question. Hi, um, and thanks to all the, the, the panelists um, for, for um, your, your speeches today. I just wanted to hear a little bit more on the 
the stuff. Rory, could you just introduce uh, who you are and where you're from? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Rory from the Syria campaign uh, and I'm calling from the UK. Um, I'd just like to hear um, a bit more specifically from, from the Germany, UK and French representatives about uh, what steps you would take for a comprehensive approach to justice in Syria. And I know there's different models and there's talk about international tribunals or the International Criminal Court. And I know that these approaches all have different um, uh, you know, block blockages uh, and challenges, but I would like to just hear what your perspectives are on where you think there's the most opportunity for progress or the um, the greatest chance to really achieve a comprehensive justice for for Syrian victims. Thank you. Can I take a couple more uh, oral questions before we? Uh, uh, come back and respond. And I think uh, next on our list is Bassam. You could uh, introduce yourself and uh, and ask a question, please. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bassam Tablia. Uh, my question is, uh, I strongly believe that the soft indolence and attitude from the international society led Assad to wrongly believe that there is no punishment will be imposed on him, which led him to commit more crimes against humanity and his own people. The question is, when the international society will take a stronger and tougher decision against him and his uh, crimes, Especially, we know that he wants to legitimize his crimes through the untransparent and illegal elections. I understood with many thanks to Ambassador Rod about his, uh, the international uh, this, uh, punishment that he cannot go for security council to get a resolution. However, we believe that there is alternative way as well through the United Nations General Assembly where we can uh, try to get a decision or a solution simply because Assad is threatening the peace uh, of the society or the international society. With many thanks. Okay, thank you. Two, two... Uh, excellent questions. I'm, I'm very keen that we hear especially from our Syrian panelists this morning, uh, this afternoon. So if I may, I'll, I'll ask uh, Robert and, and Francois to respond quickly to those two questions and then I would invite people to uh, particularly for direct questions at our, at our Syrian panelists if I may. So the two questions, one from Rory was about uh, a comprehensive approach to, to justice in Syria and from Bassam on um, whether uh, the international community can get tougher on Assad, and in particular, whether we can use a UN General Assembly um, mechanism for that. So if you could very quickly uh, just respond to those, Robin and uh, Francois, then we can uh, have more questions for the panel. Thank you. Should I start, Jonathan, quickly? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, first, I mean, to Rory, um, um, his question, I mean, of a comprehensive approach. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, there are several elements and I touched upon them already um, in my introductory statement. I mean, if the way to the international tribunal is blocked, I mean, we have the way uh, through uh, nat national legislation. I mean, we are pursuing this in Germany. But uh, and in France and in other countries, but I mean, um, this um, universal jurisdiction is not valid in, in each and every country, but in Germany, we are pursuing it. And I mean, we keep, we, we keep up the pressure, I mean, um, in, in each and every fora in the UN and other foras, I mean, we are going publicly, I mean, we are in favor of um, um, organizing events. And I mean, we are supporting and on the other side, I mean, we keep up pressure um, as much as we can 
on Russia and, 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 and the regime. And there, I mean, I go to the second question of, of, of Basile. It is true, I mean, a stronger and tougher answer is certainly necessary. But if we rule out a military solution, uh, um, uh, then, I mean, uh, we have um, different le leverages and, I mean, we are using them. I mean, uh, I mean, you know that, I mean, we sanction especially individuals who committed these crimes. Um, there will be no um, um, uh, reconstruction without a political solution and accountability and no normalization. So I, I, I know that's not enough, but I mean, um, and we are also exploring the alternative of the General Assembly. However, the General Assembly cannot establish an international court because there you need a, a, a UN security resolution. But I mean, the way to go public and uh, to seek support of the General Assembly in New York is certainly a way that, that we pursue. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, very briefly, Francois, anything to add to that? Just very, yes, very briefly. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, uh, Robert. I agree, of course, with um, what Robert just uh, said. I think we are uh, uh, working uh, with uh, all the, um, opportunities we have to to raise this issue in every uh, each and every fora and uh, in uh, each and every conversation negotiations we have with our uh, partners and um, on Syria so be sure uh, that uh, this issue is really on top of our uh, priority now getting um, of course a, a backing official backing from the um, from the UN is is very important. So we are working with the Secretary General's special uh, envoy, and he's very mobilized on uh, on this. Once again, we think this is one uh, issue that should be put on the on the table uh, in the framework of the implementation of two two um, five four. And of course, the Security Council is is the key institution, uh, of course, to uh, to 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 tackle the uh, the issue. And to stimulate the, um, the implementation of a um, of a political process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now the floor is open for. I. I. I we have such a privilege to have uh, Nora and Anna and Niveen with us. Uh, I'm very very keen to. Uh, use that privilege while we have them. So the floor is open for questions for them. Maybe uh, while you are thinking about that, I, I can ask a, a question um, in the meantime, maybe, maybe for... This. It is clear that one of the things that you have been doing as you take your bus around uh, around Europe and the world is to try to uh, draw attention to uh, the plight of uh, detainees and missing people and their families. And uh, one of the, the jobs that I think that we have is to, to help to uh, keep this in the public eye. And that's one of the reasons why we're having this session today. So I would be interested in your feel at the moment for how, uh, how, how successful you feel you're being in terms of keeping uh, the world's attention focused on this issue and whether there is more that you or we or, or others can do in order to do that uh, so that we can make sure that there continues to be some international momentum behind your campaigns. Sorry, Jonathan, but you were like um, interrupted somehow, so we, we couldn't hear the whole question. Can you please briefly repeat it? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Uh, it, it, it was a question about uh, how you are collectively feeling about international um, uh, understanding of this as you go around campaigning and trying to keep attention focused on detainees and missing persons and, and their families. Um, what can you or we or other people do to make sure that this remains uh, high on the international agenda and we continue to have some international momentum behind your campaigns? So I assume you are asking me. 
uh, and families for free I, or Nora. I, I, why don't Sorry. You start, why okay. don't you start and then uh, and then maybe I can go to Nora. Okay. So yeah, uh, sure. I mean, um, as a member of Families for Freedom, we what is very special about this movement is that they are women, especially women, that they have lost their husbands, their uh, sons, their um, brothers, their daughters, their sisters, and 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 the prisons, and uh, they like, let's say they start from scratch to build this movement um, and to to try to collect all voices around the world for every single Syrian woman um, to call for for freedom, justice, and uh, revealing the destiny of of, of uh, uh, the detainees in Syrian prisons. I mean, um, what is what's what have been done until until now? It's very um, it's very strong. <clears throat> Uh, especially we, as we've heard from the Mr. Um, uh, ambassadors, or th that at the moment, like nothing on the level of the community uh, of the international community can be done directly against the Assad regime because he's supported with uh, other strong, um, power, powerful countries. <laughs> And we all know the situation in Syria and how it is. But we all believe that, like a small effort, with a small f, with a small effort, at the end they could be do a very big, remarkable efforts. And um, what well, we expect that, like people could support in all these events, because when we when we um, when we plan for an event or where we go for an event for our detainees, moreover, we have people around us to support, moreover, this event will reach. Um, so, and, and, and the charter itself is a, is a clear map, how could we do and what should, we, should, what should be done to reveal the destiny of, of detainees in, in Syria. Not only uh, by Assad regime, but also with the whole, uh, with the all uh, conflict parties. Um, okay, so question. shall I continue? Yeah, there's another question here for Nora. Um, can you tell us about the situation of women from families? of detainees in regional countries like Lebanon and Turkey and inside Idlib? Okay, well, first I will just continue after Naveen, after the question about um, like a kind of our target of the uh, advocacy uh, with with the families of freedom or no photo zone. Actually, our purpose uh, when target people by the, the red bus, for example, the freedom bus, we target this like public opinion in, in Europe and um, like the West uh, people. So we target people to like to get their attention to 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 get their solidarity with with us as families of um, of missing persons and to see that we are people we are persons we are not statistic and and just numbers but when we target uh, the states and the governments of uh, of the west and excuse me to be so honest and hope that my answer will not affect our fund on uh, of no photo zone i'm just kidding so we want them to act not only to be like um, in, in a kind of solidarity and emotional uh, impression, we want them to act seriously. We just want to end all of this because detention and enforced disappearance is still continues in, in Syria by like the Assad regime and other uh, members in the Syrian regime and their alliance are still in the power in, in Syria. For the situation of, uh, of the, uh, the families and especially women in the neighboring countries, we already know that the neighboring countries have a lot of Syrian refugees and mostly in Lebanon, which is like the situation in Lebanon is totally bad even to Lebanese. So what about these refugees that don't have any kind of their, of their daily basis? 
needs every day. And I'm talking about most of them are women because most of the enforced disappeared and detainees are men. So women are left alone like raising their their children alone they are not only families members of the Tunis and muslim persons they are refugees they lived under siege and bombing they are uh, without any kind of um, like uh, of services especially that they cannot approve the death of their their men and the families so they are uh, deprived of all the services that are provided by the uh, ingos and ngos in syria and uh, in in lebanon sorry for for syrians so it's very important to focus on on their women and to have a kind of aid like medical legal educational economic services for specifically the families of uh, enforced disappeared and uh, and basically women because in our zone we basically target women and youth uh, like sons and daughters of missing persons and i urge you actually to to go and visit these women in the camps not to take photos but to listen to them and to to give them the feeling that they are listening uh, and uh, they are heard and seen and they they must be as i said in my intervention represented in all the international forms it's it's the time now to to listen to all syria not only to specific activists including me actually we we need to like to extend uh, that 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 targeted people in in our uh, act and the resolution uh, on syria thank you Thank you very much. Uh, we are nearly coming to the end of our time. I don't know whether anybody has one uh, one final question for any of our panelists. If if not pressingly, uh, then. Uh, we will thank you very, very much. Um, I have, but uh, ah, do you have, sorry? Somebody coming in with one with a question? Yeah, I uh, raised my hand, but uh, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Please, please do introduce yourself and come in. Okay. Uh, I'm talk in Arabic. I'm Rena Sino. And uh, in the beginning, I want to thank um, my colleagues, uh, Noura, Naveen, and uh, Amir. And um, I really hope that your efforts will um, reach the targets. I have two questions. One to the Syrian panelists, my colleagues, and uh, another question to the European representatives. Um, uh, my first question to the panelists, um, the political um, speeches, how did they affect your work? Um, how did, do they affect your efforts uh, for justice and freedom uh, on a local or international level? I'm talking about uh, the political uh, speech uh, on both levels. And my second question uh, to the rep representatives from the UK, France and, German, and Germany, um, we all know about the crimes um, and abhorrent crimes of the Syrian regime, but we have the feeling that the, the that uh, the justice um, or the justice process or the approach towards this is very selective. Um, I'm talking um, here about the crimes of the uh, committed by the um, military um, and the Syrian regime and also Daesh. I, I, there is also um, and other crimes committed by in other groups, but I feel that the European solidarity or approach towards justice is very selective. Um, approaches are supported um, upon um, political views or political connections uh, towards certain countries. And uh, the question um, that I um, want to ask here is um, that um, why don't we talk about um, how um, can um, all the, the international community um, address uh, crimes against humanity all over the world and this is a question that I repeat in every discussion on the issue. Thank you very much. Okay, maybe 
uh, I could ask Amma to uh, to take the first question for me, uh, just before we finish, because we're coming right to the end of our time. So Amma, maybe you could very briefly uh, give us an answer on the on the first question. Very simply, um, the political situation um, concerning what I have talked about uh, concerning ISIS and uh, the connection to um, a local um, p uh, military parties also. All the op political options that I see uh, had an, a very huge impact on the movements or the f fates, uh, so to say, um, of the Daytonees and uh, also to the truth about their faith. Um, these um, efforts um, led to the accountability of uh, the uh, perpetrators. Um, but also, um, the other parties who commit crimes against uh, the, the Syrians, uh, like, uh, for example, not revealing truths uh, about the fates um, or um, truths about connections to other military groups. To sum it up, the political and military situation um, was a very decisive element um, in tackling this issue. So when we talk about ISIS, um, I have to stress this uh, thing. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much uh, to all of you for being part of this extremely moving event. I am so privileged to have had the uh, honour of, uh, of chairing this event uh, and of hosting it alongside French and, and German colleagues and of hearing in particular from Naveen and Amr and Noura uh, and their extremely powerful testimonies, um, which I know uh, all of us will have taken uh, very much to heart. Um, you know, this is way beyond a, a, a political question. And as, we, uh, as I said earlier, this is a, a national and international trauma and an international uh, scandal. And it is our job to make sure that it is not a, uh, it, it is not a scandal of impunity. And that is what uh, we uh, are all striving towards. Uh, for this morning, I want to thank very much our translators, uh, Nicola Abbas and Nashwa Abdu, uh, without whom this would absolutely not have been possible. Uh, so many thanks uh, to them. Um, and thank you to Syria Campaign and uh, everybody else behind the scenes who has made this, made this event uh, what it is. And, uh, and thank you. Um, uh, and many thanks to my French and German colleagues, uh, Robert and, um, uh, and Francois for, for co-hosting. Um, as I say, I mean, I, I have found this uh, both incredibly moving, but also very galvanizing. Um, I, have, I hear what you say, Noura uh, uh, and other colleagues um, on our, both our need to listen, uh, particularly to women and women's voices, and not just in Syria, but in the region. I have had the privilege of doing that uh, a number of times in, in, in all parts of the region, and uh, I know how powerful that can be. Uh, but I also very much hear the frustration that you're expressing that goes with that. It is not enough for us to listen. Uh, we also uh, must all try to turn listening and understanding into action. Um, it's not a secret that this is uh, complex, difficult, incredibly difficult to uh, bring the evidence together, to uh, bring the, the right people together that we need in order to make progress on, on these cases in a very concrete way. But we have made some progress uh, and we've made some progress recently and we are um, privileged to have extremely courageous and committed Syrian colleagues on the ground uh, and in the region such as yourselves who are able to, to feed that progress. And uh, we, as the international community, uh, you know, recommit to uh, doing our best to use the evidence, use the information that we have 
in order to, to hold those to account who are perpetrating these crimes. It's not going to be easy and it's not going to be quick, but uh, it won't be through lack of effort or political will uh, on our part, both specifically on the, on the justice side. And I very much hear the plea for a comprehensive approach to that. And I agree with that. Uh, but also, as uh, Ambassador Sinimo said at the beginning, there's no peace without justice and no justice without peace. So what, uh, what, what we are mostly depending on is uh, some progress towards a peaceful political solution in Syria. And that is something that we all continue to work uh, day by day as hard as we possibly can to do. So I thank you again. Uh, you have been so open, so personal, uh, so moving, and we will all take away uh, your words uh, it, 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 in ourselves. And I'm sure that it will re-galvanize us all to do everything we can uh, to address this situation. So thank you. And thank you all for participating this morning, this afternoon. Um, and uh, I look forward to continuing our work together. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you to all. Bye bye. Thank you very much also from my side. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day. It was a pleasure.